If you believe God for a miracle and you know we can do the impossible, shout yeah. Yes, I believe God for a miracle. We have been examining the Holy Spirit, and we started out talking about Jesus' promise that he was coming here, the Holy Spirit was coming among us to first reveal Christ to us, to remind us of the things that Jesus taught us, and then to serve as the helper that's necessary to enable us to live the Christian life. Then from there, we went into the character development that the Holy Spirit gives out of Galatians chapter 5, showing the conflict of the fruit of the Spirit and the works of the flesh. And we spent a significant amount of time in dealing with character change, character development, which is the uh, sign that you are born again. When your character changes, that means Christ is living inside. You can't change your character on your own. So only Christ can change that. Now I want to go into uh, a function that the Spirit provides, uh, and now I need you to broaden your thought pattern. Um, from 1 Corinthians, First Corinthians chapter one. When we come to Christ, there is the need to unteach and disassociate as we are taught and made to associate. One phase of life is replaced by another. You can't come to Jesus and hold on to the old man. But the old man won't let go right away. So he has to be taught off. You with me? He won't go of his own volition, of his own will. He has to be replaced by a new teaching that's more dynamic more energetic, and more fruitful. Your Christian evolution is tantamount to your school process. When you were in kindergarten, it was fun. Learning was equal to fun. All of your lessons were communicated through fun things. Uh, Nothing was arduous. Nothing was difficult. It was all fun. You were taught sharing and all those other things. And then as you began to migrate through elementary school, fun was slowly being replaced by responsibility. You notice that by the time you get to about third grade, the teacher is no longer holding your hand in everything you watch a kindergarten class cross the street. They're all holding hands, and they form a, a chain and walk across the street. But by the time you get to third grade, the teacher basically kind of stands there and says, all right, everybody go, and you begin to grow. And, and then college is a whole nother animal altogether. Teachers don't even help you with lessons. They just throw a syllabus to you and say, that's what I want to accomplish. And you get 750 pages to read and then write a 300-page paper on what you read. And if you're successful in communicating that truth, you get your degree. It's a, it's a whole different world from kindergarten where the teacher will walk over and say, now what's one egg plus one egg? Now by the time you get to college, they're saying, what came first, the chicken or the egg? So they, college is not about learning. 
College is about developing critical thinking skills. That's all it's about. It's not about learning. It's, it's, it's I mean, come on, algebra is algebra. Trigonometry is trigonometry. But it's about developing the critical thinking skills. So you read 150 pages of something and then say what it means. That's how Christianity is. When you first came to Christ, it was shout, dance, rejoice, have a good time. The devils that you encountered were small devils who were just designed to get you to become too tired to pray and read your Bible. But as you grow in God and your, your process of growth and development continues, you start meeting devils who cause you to question. And once you start questioning God, your salvation is at risk in this sense that you will no longer be able to justify many of the things that you go through or do because you're questioning God, you see. And so that's what the devil wants. He wants us to question God. And the greatest way to do that is to look at your life and say, I'm not changing. There's nothing different about me. Am I really saved? But differences aren't always easily identified. Growth is not easily measured. Even as a child, you, 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 you don't even recognize that you're growing until you see your trousers are short and you can't fit certain things anymore. And then you have that, that, that spurt where you just maybe three or four inches and then boom, and then you, that's it, you're done. But outside of that spurt, you can't even tell that you're growing. Someone else has to look in and say, wow, you sure are getting bigger than the last time I saw you. But you don't really know it. That's how your Christian life is. You don't really know you're growing until God puts idiots in your life. Now, I can look at you and tell that you're growing, but you don't know it until God puts jerks in your life. And then you say, wow, they no longer bother me anymore. Six months ago, I would get upset when I saw you. Now, today, I'm like, you don't matter. You're growing. You're developing. And then you're no longer, you're no longer uh, directed by their actions. Their actions don't, 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 don't cause you to react. You're growing. The spirit is developing character. You're walking in love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, meekness, temperance, and faith. You are really becoming a Christian. Or as Paul tells the Galatian church, Christ is being formed in us. But to what end? But to what end? The Bible is a, a book that teaches cultural truths from the East and tries to get them to become absorbed in the West. And it's a very difficult job. Because Western thinking is different than Eastern thinking, and the Bible is an Eastern book. It teaches service. It teaches submission. It teaches honoring others, which are not Western mindsets. And so why is God going through all of this effort to build our character, to fit you into something called the body of Christ? The assimilation into the body of Christ is the zenith of your Christian experience. To become one of us and function as one of us is the goal of your existence. If you read here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says, Now I beseech you, brethren, verse 10, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. That there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For what has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the household of Chiloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you that says, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I am of Christ, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized anybody else. For Christ sent me not to baptize, 
But he sent me to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. And Paul tries to insist that you are, you are developing cliques based on my ministerial actions, and you ought not do that. I was saved under pastor's ministry. I was saved under so-and-so's ministry. Therefore, I have an allegiance to that person. Paul said, is Christ divided? All of us ministers, we serve one Lord, and we function in one body. And so now we go to the, the, what I call the, the doctorate program of the body of Christ, and that is making us one. We can brag about the Holy Spirit being in us. We can brag about the power. We can brag about the demonstration. We can brag about all the works of the Spirit of God. But the actual work of the Spirit is oneness. Jesus tries to illustrate this in John's Gospel when he says to the Father in that priestly prayer, Lord, make them one. Father, make them one. As we are one, what a monumental task for the Spirit of God to make us one as the Father is one with his Son. Think about that for a moment. The oneness that Jesus endeavors to bring to his body transcends racism, transcends ethnicities. Racism is not of God. God uh, brings us all together. No one is superior to anyone else, and no one should, should lean towards one race above another. Racism is of the devil. Color doesn't matter to God. Amen. And so we love anyone that's born again as my brother or my sister. And so we need to abolish anything else. We need to abolish anything else. We need to abolish anything else but how does this work how does this function the greatest example of the body of christ comes from our own body if you notice in first in uh, ephesians chapter 4 the apostle writes sort of along the same lines as he writes to uh, the church at corinth he's trying to develop something here he immediately begins his, his uh, dissertation in, in, in chapter 4. I he says, uh, I beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. What are we called to be? Little Jesuses. He says, you do this with all lowliness and meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring, work hard at keeping the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Why? Because there's only one body. There is only one body. We are joined together with our brothers and sisters in Europe. We are joined together with our brothers and sisters in Asia. We are joined together with our brothers and sisters throughout the world. And if there are born-again people on Mars, they are our brothers and sisters. And so you must think beyond your own little areas and your own little clique and your own little group. You must think beyond your own little ideologies and see yourself as part of a whole. This is something that suffers in this postmodern world. Uh, one of the signs of the postmodern thought is that there are no absolutes. And second is that there's no unity. You find this with our young people. Our young people don't work together. They fight against each other for the most minuscule of things. We don't seem to want to come together anymore because we are, as a nation, as a people, separate. There was a time when we would come together, when people in the neighborhoods flourished because there was unity, there was love and acceptance. Crime rates were low not because of a proliferation of police officers, but because people watched out for each other. But we, as we began to become more self-centered, more self-righteous, more hypocritical in our behaviors with our fellow man, we pulled away from that watching out for each other and only began to care about ourselves. And then we saw the decline of civilization. Families that once were, were strong from hanging out together and being together were now distant and disconnected. 
And I, am, I would hazard a guess that there are some of you here this morning that have family members that you don't even speak to anymore. 20 years ago, these were things that were unheard of. But today, we are no longer connected. It is my conviction that what we bring into the church on a single service is what we live in six days a week. So if you are disconnected from your family six days a week, it is difficult for you to connect with your family in church. And so the preacher beats their head against the wall trying to create unity to a person who has not been taught how to unify. It starts with marriage. It starts with the family. If you hate your wife, brothers, you are going to hate other people. Wives, if you despise your husband, you will despise your pastor. You cannot give to your pastor what you do not give to your family because the church is supposed to be a mirror image of family. That's why Paul says before you put someone into the bishopric, look at how they treat their family because the person who mistreats their family will, the, will mistreat the family of God. You can't separate the two because what you are at home is what you will be in church. What you are lacking at home, you will try to make up for it in church. Abusive people in church are abusive people at home. You just don't hear about it. And so in essence, a person can become a public success but a private failure. And so you'll find that their marriages will dissolve. You'll find that their children don't respect them. You will find that their lives are in disarray because they have not yet learned how to work together and be one. Now, I, I, I know this is difficult and some of you are going to struggle with this only because you have no point of reference. We can't even come together as a people. And now I speak specifically to my own people. We can't even come together as a people. Why? Because we've been taught to despise each other. We are so full of self-hatred and self-loathing that we can't even edify one another in God because we don't even want to hire our own people. We don't want to live around our own people. We don't even want to marry our own people. We don't want to be around our own people. But I got news for you. There are people that you despise are going to be in heaven. And you're going to have to get along with me in heaven. So the Bible says the way you go to heaven will be reflective of the way you are here. So that's why he says, he that is holy, let him be holy still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. In other words, you can't be a hypocrite in heaven. So you better get it together now. Why do you think God is leaving you here to learn love? You won't need to learn it in heaven, but you sure will have to walk in it. So now you better learn it here. Amen. Amen. You think God, God doesn't take us to heaven uh, because he's not ready for us. He doesn't take us because we're not ready to go. If God were to take some of us up to heaven now, he would have another Lucifer situation up in heaven. Somebody trying to underwrite his word with their feelings and come against his directives with their arrogance. So he uses situations to chastise us, to make us think for the good of the body more than the good of myself. Are you with me? Well, how is all this going to come to pass? If you notice here, Paul teaches that uh, there is something interesting in, 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 in chapter 4 of, of Ephesians. He says in verse 4, there is only one body. How many bodies? How many? How many? How many? How many? How many? There is one body. And how many spirits? How many? How many? He said, even as you are called into how many hopes? How many hopes? How many hopes? All right, uh, there's only one body motivated by one spirit who brings you into one hope of your calling. Why does God act in this fashion? Because he wants to eliminate competition. He, wants, he doesn't want you stumbling over which God to serve. Now, here's what the devil does. The devil tries to give God a whole bunch of names. Belial, Allah, all those other things. And then he confuses people by saying, well, Allah is just another name for God. The devil's a liar. Jesus, when Jesus taught spiritual warfare, he told the disciples, the devil is a liar. That's it. That's all you need to know about the devil. He's a liar. Okay? God's name throughout this Bible is, is not uh, Allah or Belial. So if you are an Allah person, you are not worshiping Jesus. 
because Allah is not God. He may be a God, but he's not the God. And then furthermore, if you want to say I'm, I'm still serving God by serving Allah, then what you going to do with Jesus? Because the scripture says every knee shall bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. If you believe God for a miracle and you know we can do the impossible, shout yeah. Yes, I believe God for a miracle. And if you trust that he'll do what he said he would, in the end it will work out for your good.